so first of all what i'm actually going to do is that i'm going to start off discussing about i'm going to start off discussing about this uh, uh, sbr thing and uh, i would just let you know that what exactly is the agenda for our session today the session that we are going to be conducting today there is a two point agenda that is basically how to prepare sbr from 25th july till 31st august that's the first thing that you have to do the second thing is that i would actually uh, be doing the practice questions on is 19 employee benefits and in case plus revision of is 19 so that is something that i am going to be doing today now let me just start off let me just tell you let me just guide you a few things about how exactly do you wish to prepare how exactly would you prepare the sbr in this in this limited time that is available now i had a session with the students yesterday and they a uh, majority of them were actually struggling because they had not yet started preparing for the syllabus so what i will do right now is that i will discuss the core areas of the syllabus i will discuss the core yellow i'll discuss the core areas of the syllabus and i would just let you know that how exactly you could prepare now number one point is i don't know if you all are enrolled somewhere or you're doing a self study but first thing first is that you need to understand the important areas which could help you pass there are few accounting standards which are examined almost every attempt if i start off the first one of them is about the ias 12 which is about the income taxes so if you have a good grip appropriate grip over the ias 12 income taxes you would be able to score good marks so ias 12 uh, they usually the deferred tax scenarios that are tested uh the deferred tax that are usually arising for the ias 16 pp cases ias 40 cases uh at times uh, the ifrs 2 cases and at times the deferred tax related to the group accounts also that is also examined so first of all you got to know that how exactly are you going to do the accounting for ias 12 now the second thing is that you should know about ias 19 the employee benefits so this is a complete accounting standard and usually you would see that there are 5 to 6 marks or let's say 4 to 5 marks that are going to be examined in every attempt pertaining to ias 19 somewhere or the other somewhere or the other the examiner would examine this area the third thing is about ias 21 which is the effects of changes in foreign exchange rate now if i could just recall that what exactly is this is 21 all about so with respect to is 21 there are two types of areas one of them is foreign exchange transactions and the other one of them is about the foreign subsidiary so there are two areas with respect to the ifis 21 and believe me you would see that this is 21 is one of those accounting standard that is examined almost every attempt where it would either be part and parcel of the group account scenario or it would be a separate adjustment pertaining to the is 21 that is going to be examined so you got to be ready with it then the fourth accounting standard that you should know is about the financial instruments so the most commonly examined areas for the financial instruments are the accounting for financial assets accounting for financial liability the compound financial instruments 
the derivative transactions, the impairment of financial asset and hedge. Hedge accounting has been examined only once or twice. So this is a less examined area, but the most examined area is this and this. So the compound financial instrument and the impairment of financial assets are those areas that are examined a lot. Then we move a bit forward and we discuss further. So the next area that is examined a lot is IAS 38, which is about intangible assets. I know a lot of you people would be like, uh, why is this IS 38 being examined a lot? Now, the problem with respect to it is that there are different assets. Like for example, the staff contracts, even nowadays, the cryptocurrency contracts and etc. Yes, the recordings would be available. They're all being made part and parcel of IS 38. And you would just come across a scenario with respect to IS 38 in the examinations where it would be a common scenario. It would be a scenario where you would think like that, which is specific accounting standard is this examined? And it is most likely going to be an accounting standard pertaining to IS 38. So a lot of real life scenarios are examined and then somehow or the other connect to IS 38. So I repeat, a lot of real life scenarios are examined and this somehow or the other connect to IAS 38, the intangible assets. So that's also one thing that you would have to see. Then if I move forward, the next thing is the IFRS 2, which is share-based payment transactions. And the most commonly examined area is equity settled transaction or cash settled transaction. Then you've got number seven, which is IFRS 15, revenue a mandatory adjustment. Then you've got IFRS 16, which is the leases, again, a mandatory adjustment usually. And lastly, you've got the group accounts. Now, you all would know that group account is 20% question confirmed in every attempt. The question number one, that you are being tested every attempt, which is of 30 mark, usually 20 mark are about the group accounts. Usually 20 mark are about the group accounts. So what I would actually recommend you people is that, because a lot of the students, they get, they get, they, they, they spend a lot of time uh, doing the FR accounting standard revision they spend time on the SME accounting standard. Then they spend time on a lot of current issues and all that. Then the students would spend time on the IASB framework. They would spend time on the ethics, et cetera, et cetera. I am not saying that you skip these, but I'm telling you one thing, that if you do these seven, eight topics or nine topics, I am guaranteeing you that you will be able to handle 65% of the paper. Now, so the first thing that you should try to do is that you should try to actually go through these specific areas first. You should try to, I can just zoom out so that you could take the screenshot. I could just zoom out. I am zooming it out now. So you could take the screenshot. Now this is the second screen, second page. Okay, now let's move a bit forward. And let's discuss further. So basically, instead of focusing on these areas, you rather focus on these and you'd be able to get a good hands on. Now see, um, there is another thing which I would tell you, which is basically 80-80 rule. 
what is that 80 80 rule a lot of students what does 4 to 5 relate under is 549 okay it says that either 5 to 6 mark or 4 to 5 marks that's what i'm telling you now there is an 80 80 rule which i would recommend you people to remember a lot of students what they do is that they try to i mean like a general perception is that we should only be able to pass if we attempt 100% paper. I would say it's a wrong approach. It's not necessary that you attempt 100% of the paper. Because what happens is that if you attempt 100, if you try to go for attempting the 100% of the paper and you don't do it at merit, you won't be able to pass. Because you see, if you fail at 48, so that means you have done 52 marks incorrect. Now, why do 52 marks incorrect? I would rather go for an approach which is 80-80, which is I would do 80% of the paper. I would not rush to go for 100% paper. And I would try to do this 80% correctly. So because what happens is that when I get this 80-80 rule, it's a 64% that I'm going to be scoring. And if I do some adjustments and all that, so maybe, around 60% marks and all that we need is 50 marks. I bet all that we need is 50 marks. You get it, all that we need is 50 marks. So my recommendation is never to do the whole paper. I think that it's, it's something of a wrong approach. Yes, obviously our time management is the key, but even if you do 80% of the paper, you can still pass provided you do it correctly. So you should try to answer at merit. Don't try to rush yourself, but just make sure that when you are attempting, you're attempting well. But no, if you are not well prepared, and if you think, no, 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 I'll do some, I'll do some that, I'll do some that. Okay, then go ahead and try to attempt the whole paper and try to score 50 marks. But that's again, why to do 50% paper incorrectly? You're getting my point. We try to, we try to actually, I mean, you see, yes, uh, uh, Tony, that's that's what's always helpful. Ali Ahmed, uh, if you are saying that which question should be priority, I would say usually what happens is the students are good at question number one. Um, yes, that's what I'm saying that whatever you do, do it well. And then you don't have to attempt the whole paper. Okay, now see, Ali Ahmad, question number one and question number two, they are marks scoring question in SBR. Question number one, question number two are marks scoring question in SBR. So I would, I would recommend that always do question number one and question number two first in SBR. Is this okay now? Now, anyone has any questions up till now? Okay, lovely. So this is general approach that I would suggest you people to go about. Now I'll move a bit forward. And uh, now uh, my question to you people is that how many of you are okay with IS-19, the employee benefits? Can you just uh, raise your hands? How many of you are okay with the IS-19? Okay, I've got one hand raised. Two. That's it. Three. Okay, what else? Who else? Four, three, four. Okay, 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 not expert. Okay, now see, I could see around 10, 12 people suggesting that they're okay with IS-12. So unfortunately, that does not equate to the, that does not equate to the majority. So I would rather prefer 
to do some discussion on IS-19 employee benefits, and then I could just go on doing some questions on IS-19. So if I could just have a quick recall of IAS, again, I'm telling you, I'm not teaching IS-19 right now. I'm just having a quick recall of IS-19 employee benefits. So when we talk about IS-19 employee benefits, in accordance with IS-19 employee benefits, there are basically four types of employee benefits that are there. What are those four type of employee benefits? One of them is termed as short-term employee benefits. The other one of them is termed as long-term employee benefits. Third one of them is termed as post-employment benefit. And the fourth one of them is called termination benefit. Now, what exactly are these different type of benefits, the long-term, short-term? So usually the short-term employee benefits are those benefits which are paid within 12 months period. Like for example, you've got salary, you've got wages, you've got other expenses like I paid, you've got the salaries, you've got the wages, you've got the bonus, you've got the overtime, et cetera, et cetera. They're all considered as the short-term employee benefits. Then we have got the long-term employee benefits that are payable for more than 12 months. The ones which are payable for more than 12 months, they're considered to be the long-term employee benefits. Now, what exactly are the examples of the long-term employee benefits? So like, for example, if you have a permanent disability allowance, like at times what happens is a lot of people, they get injured at the workplace. Now, if you are somebody who got injured at the workplace, so by getting injured at the workplace, what would happen is that uh, you would now be entitled to have a disability allowance for the rest of your life a disability allowance for the rest of your life. Similarly, is if it is a long-term leave, so long-term leave is like, let's say two-year, three-year leave. A lot of people, they go on to two-year, three-year leave and they continuously get some benefit or even if they don't get the benefit, their employment period is actually counted. So that's called a long-term, long-term employee benefits. The third one of them is a post-employment benefit and the examples of them include the pension. The examples include the provident fund. The examples include the graduate fund, things like that. And termination benefits are basically those benefits which are paid upon termination of services. There are the benefits which are paid upon termination of services. So some of the examples of it are golden handshake schemes, voluntary separation schemes. Then there is this severance pay. Things like that they're all gonna be considered as what termination benefits. I bet they're all gonna be considered as termination benefits. They're all gonna be considered as termination benefits. Now, when we talk about the termination benefits, so we have an idea that termination benefits are other than post-employment benefits. And why are these termination benefits uh, arising? These termination benefits are usually paid um, are usually paid upon termination of services rather than the rather than the retirement. Like the employee is not leaving voluntarily, he's being forced to leave the employment, uh, even though it could be a voluntary force, uh, forceful retirement. But if somebody is asked to retire forcefully, that's called a uh, termination. Now, how do we account for all of these benefits? So, uh, generally speaking, the short-term employee benefits. The short-term employee benefits are recognized on an accrual basis. They are recognized on an accrual basis. Similarly, when we talk about 
the long term employee benefits the long term employee benefits are the benefits which are again recognized um, on a present value basis because if they are going to be paid after a certain period of time they're going to be recognized on a present value basis again the termination benefits are going to be recognized on an accrual basis and for the post employment benefits it is actually the classification of the schemes. Now, how exactly do we go about classification of the schemes and all that? So let me just give you a bit of an idea. Uh, with respect to, I am repeating again, I am not teaching, I'm recalling. With respect to the post-employment benefits, there's basically two types of plans. One of them is called defined contribution plan. And the other one of them is called defined benefit plan. Now what's a defined contribution plan and what's a defined benefit plan? So when I talk about defined contribution plan, the general examples of a contribution plan is a provident fund. What happens is the entity is legal and constructive obligation is to pay an agreed contribution into a separate legal entity called the fund. Like for example, what happens with respect to the provident fund is, generally speaking, under the provident fund, some portion of salary, let's say 10% of basic salary is deducted. Let's say if some employee's basic salary of 10% turns out to be $300, the employer would actually give an equal contribution. And this equal contribution, that means $600 would be kept in a separate legal entity. This separate legal entity would deposit the money here and there. So let's say it goes on and on and on. And usually what happens is, let's say if the employee's total $5,000 have been contributed into a separate legal entity, including the contributions by the employee, contributions by the employer. And somehow or the other, this plan runs into losses. And now only $2,000 are remaining. So if the employee comes to the entity and he says that I was expecting minimum 5,000 plus the interest plus the returns, there's only $2,000 available. So as per IS 19, if it's a defined contribution plan, which a provident fund is, so entity is only legally or constructively obliged to settle. There is only a legal or the constructive obligation for the entity to settle. And that legal or constructive obligation for the entity to settle is basically going to be uh, unpaid amount. So if let's say 2,500 was deducted from the employee's salary, and 2,500 was to be contributed by the employer. If he has not paid any amount from this, then he has to contribute. Otherwise, he don't have to contribute. So basically, entity's only legal or constructive obligation is to pay an agreed contribution into a separate legal entity, which is called the fund. Into a separate legal entity called the fund. Into a separate legal entity called the fund.
Okay, just wait a bit, please. Just wait a minute, please. Okay, now, so basically what happens is this is a defined contribution plan. And what is a defined benefit plan? So by definition, it's actually any plan other than any plan other than Any plan other than defined contribution plan? Any plan other than defined contribution plan? Any plan which is other than defined contribution plan? That's considered as defined benefit plan. I mean, that's how the definition, right? Now, if I actually talk about it, that, okay, if this is what the definition is, so let's just try to understand. Basically, Basically, I need to explain to you a concept of the risk. I need to explain to you the concept of risk. <clears throat> now, what exactly do you mean by risk? Uh, when we invest the money anywhere, I mean, like whether that be mutual fund, whether that be shares, stocks, as we say, or whether that be a bank or debt instruments or anywhere, there's usually a risk involved. So under this basically defined benefit plan, the examples of this is the pension fund. The example of this is the gratuity. So generally speaking, what happens is the risk and rewards belong to employer. The entity for whom we are accounting is the employer and the risk and rewards belong to them. So generally what happens is that in order to account for this specific defined benefit plan. We create some uh, plan assets reconciliation. We create some plan obligation reconciliations, things like that actually happen. Now, how exactly do we actually go about it? So what I'll do is that I will start off with one of the questions from the revision kit. And that question from the revision kit is, basically I am assuming that you people have got uh, this uh, this BPP revision kit. I'm actually going on to question number 50 first. So I will, I will be doing the question number 50. 
And in question number 50, I will actually take you people through that how exactly do we need to handle this? Okay. So it's basically page number, the PDF page number 94. PDF page number 94. Now, this is a question which is question 50 pensions. Now it's an old question that has been adapted. And what I will actually do is that I will go through this question and I would want you people to see this and, and see that how do I actually answer this question. Now, since it's a long question, uh, let me just guide you that you don't get such type of question nowadays. Albert, you don't get such type of questions nowadays. You actually get questions. You actually get questions which are relatively shorter. They are usually su not such long questions. They're usually shorter pertaining to one single standard. So, but still, let's try to see this. It says, Joydin, a public limited company is a leading support services company which focuses on the building industry. The company would like advice on how to treat certain items under IS-19 employee benefits. The company operates the Joyden Pension Plan B, which commenced on 1st November 2006, and the Joyden Pension Plan A, which was closed to new members from 31st October 6. So there are basically two pension plans. One of them is a plan A, the other one of them is plan B, but which was open to future services uh, through accrual for, for the employees already in it. The, it says the assets of the scheme are held separate. You know, whenever he says the assets of the scheme are held separately, this means the entity maintains a separate legal entity. The entity maintains a separate legal entity. From those of the company in the funds under the control of trustees, the following information relates to two schemes. Now, what exactly is the requirement of the question? And then we'll go about it. It says, prepare a briefing note for the directors of Joyden, which includes an explanation of the nature and differences between a defined contribution plan and a defined benefit plan with a specific reference to the company's two schemes. The accounting treatment for the two joint and pension plans for year ended so and so under IS-19 employee benefits. Now, what is it that we need to do? We need to explain the nature of and differences between a defined contribution and a defined benefit plan. So let's just try to see that what's going on in here. It says pension plan A. The terms of the plan are as follows. Employees contribute 6% of their salaries to the plan, okay. Joyden contributes currently the same amount to the plan for the benefit of the employees. On retirement, employees are guaranteed. This word of guaranteed is a key word here. This word of guaranteed is a key word here. Now, why is this guaranteed a key word here? The reason being that when the employees are guaranteed, so this actually makes it a risk and rewards to be lying with the entity. This actually makes the risk and rewards to be lying with the entity. A pension which is based upon number of years of service with the company and the final salary. So these are the information that is available here. And then if I talk about pension plan B, what does it say? It says under the terms of the plan, Jordan does not guarantee, does not guarantee. any return on the contributions paid into the fund. So they are not, the company's legal and constructive obligation is limited to the amount that is contributed to fund. Following details relate to this scheme and so and so, so and so. The next thing is that it says explanation of the nature and the differences between a defined contribution plan and a defined benefit plan with a specific reference to the company's two schemes. Now, how exactly are we gonna do the answer Let's just try to see.
Yeah, the first one of them is defined benefit. And the second one of them is a defined contribution plan. The second one of them is a defined contribution plan. Now let's just see. You would say that define in accordance with IS 19, there are two types of post employment benefit schemes, namely define benefit plan and the defined contribution plan. Under the defined contribution plan, entity is only legal or constructive obligation is to pay an agreed contribution into a separate legal entity called the fund. In case if there is a shortfall in the fund at a later stage, the entity's obligation, entity's obligation is restricted to the payment of the entity's obligation is restricted to the Entity's obligation is restricted to the payment of, is restricted to the payment of non-contributed amount originally committed. In the current situation, in the current situation, the plan B is an example the plan B is an example of, plan B is an example of, defined contribution plan as this plan actually does not create any legal slash constructive obligation for the entity other than the agreed contribution. The other type of plans are the defined benefit plans in which entity has an obligation to pay guaranteed benefits to the employees irrespective of whether entity has the funds available or not. Based on the details provided, the plan A is a defined benefit plan as there is a guarantee to the employees about the benefits that they shall get from the company at the time of retirement, at the time of retirement. Do you people get it? Do you people understand this? Do you, do you people understand this? Yeah, do you understand that? How would you actually go about answering this such type of questions? Yes. Now, there is one thing that I would like to highlight. A lot of the students actually would get confused with this. They would say that we don't remember the name of the accounting standard. That is perfectly fine. That is not an issue. 
even if you don't remember, even if you don't remember the name of the standard, that is perfectly fine. Even if you don't remember the name of the standard, that is perfectly fine. Why? Because what actually happens is that you don't have to mention the name of a standard. You just write down the relevant things. You just connect it to the scenario and you will get an idea. You just type out and you would get the answer. Yeah. You would just, you would just actually type out and you would get the answer, right? It would be shared, don't worry about it. Now what next is there? So that was basically about the Joyden company. Now, if I move a bit forward and if I talk about the other aspects, the second was that accounting treatment of the two Joyden pension plans for year ended so and so under IAS 19. So what are we gonna do? It's not necessary that you go about with the plan A first, then you go about plan B. You can just go about doing the plan B and plan A also. So part B, with respect to the accounting treatment The entity shall be required to recognize the expense equal to the amount that it has committed to pay in the fund with respect to the defined contribution plan that is plan B in this scenario. That is plan B in this specific scenario. The expense, the expense to be recognized, any unpaid amounts shall be recognized as liability. So if you would look at this pension plan B, the fair value of plan assets was 21. Contributions paid by the company is 10. The contributions paid by employees are 10. So what you would do is that you would say that the entity shall be required to recognize an expense of dollar 10 million in relation to in relation to in relation to in relation to the pension plan b with respect to pension plan a the expense of this much shall be recognized under the admin. Just wait a bit, please. Just wait a bit. I'm sorry, guys. It's actually raining a lot. So uh, Adil, just wait a bit. Uh, I am going to do the curtailment. It's raining a bit. It's raining a lot. So that's why I just could not uh, continue taking my classes from uh, uh, the college. And I had to rush back to home. And here my daughters, they are constantly actually doing some uh, <laughs> light chili. They're constantly actually uh, causing disturbances. And that's the that's the, that's the biggest uh, drawback of taking the class from home. But again, uh, it's still better than, uh, uh, better than not taking the class. So uh, it's actually heavily raining here in Karachi and Karachi just cannot sustain the rain. So it's like um, uh, we've got load shadings, we have got a lot of issues. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just that things are actually happening. So uh, apologies for slight disturbances that you might actually hear some background noises of my daughters 
uh, about it. So it's unfortunate, but um, uh, <laughs> the problem of taking the class from home. So okay, anyways, thank you. Yes, Ibrahim, thank you. <laughs> Just wait a bit. Uh, she is actually, she wants to say greetings to all. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so anyways. Say it, beta. Say it, sub sub. Abab jao. Beta sub wo hai na, uncle auntie hai na. Do. Okay. Ab jao baba ko padhane do. Okay. So now, uh, let's let's actually move a bit forward. So basically, what happens is that with respect to the pension plan A, the expense of this much amount shall be recognized. The expense of this much amount shall be recognized under the admin expense. An expense of this much under the interest expense a remeasurement gain slash loss amounting to this much a remeasurement gain or loss amounting to this much to be recognized in other comprehensive income. A defined benefit liability of a defined benefit liability of this, 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 this much amount is to be recognized in the non-current liability. Now, what have I done? I would just say, refer to the calculations below. Refer to the calculations below. Now, when you would do is that, you would actually, uh, you would actually uh, go about, uh, you would actually go about filling in the blanks, but I've just explained the treatment. I'm now gonna do the calculations. So I've just explained the treatments just because you know that this is how we got to answer. This is no rocket science. It's just that you're explaining what you're doing. I bet it's no rocket science. It's just that you're explaining what you are doing. Right? Okay. So now let's try to do some calculations. We have got the interest rates on high quality corporate bonds or two plans are this and this. So always remember the opening interest rates is going to be used. Now, how exactly are we going to do the calculations? Let's try to do that. Uh, uh, uh. I'm just copying it here. We could adapt the net liability approach. What is that net liability approach? You would say opening defined benefit liability is the opening plan obligations, which is 240 minus the plan assets. Sorry, I'm just using the wrong value. The opening plan obligation is 200 minus the opening plan assets, which is 190. So it gives you 10 million. Now what happens is you would say interest expense at the rate of always use the opening rate. There are two rates given in the question. Always use the opening rate. The opening rate needs to be used. So it's actually going to be 5%. So it gives you 0 
So we have handled this information. We have handled this information. Now what happens is that you would say current service cost, which is 20. It is actually going to increase the liability. Then basically what happens is the benefits paid are not shown because they have an impact on both the asset and both the liability, so they're not shown. Then you've got the contributions which are paid into the scheme. They are actually 17. The contributions that are paid into the scheme, they're actually 17. Then what happens is there's a remeasurement gain or loss. I repeat, there's a remeasurement gain or loss that needs to be incorporated. Just wait a bit, please, one minute. Okay, so basically the closing defined benefit liability is there. The closing defined benefit liability is there. And now what happens is that we need to have the balancing figure. I bet we need to have the balancing figure. What is it? We need to have the balancing figure. Now, what is the balancing figure going to be? Let's just try to see that. The balancing figure is actually the remeasurement gain loss. Now, a lot of the students, they actually have an issue with respect to this remeasurement gain loss. Now, what exactly is the issue that they face? Let's try to understand that. The students, they face an issue that they don't understand whether we need to, I mean, like if it's a positive figure or a negative figure, how should we react? See, it's 10 plus 0.5 plus 20 minus 17. How much is it going to 30.5 minus 17? So how much does it turn out to be? How is there a 1.5 loss? Can anyone please confirm how much is the loss? Okay, now see it's 10 plus 0.5 plus 20 minus 17. So there is basically up till now here, it's 13.5 and this is 15. So it's 1.5 increase. Now, if it's an increase, it's actually going to be a loss because we are actually, we are actually going ahead with the liability as a positive balance. 
So even this liability is a positive balance. This liability is a positive balance. This liability is a positive balance. So if the liability till here was 13.5 and here it's 15, so that, there, that means there is an increase in the liability and it has to be considered as a loss. Now, the question mark is, it is not needed here in the question, but just to give you a bit of an idea, I'm just gonna pass on the double entry for this. I, I am telling you the question does not require you to, the question does not require you to pass on the double entry, but I'm just gonna record the double entries. Why am I gonna record the double entries? Just because I want to make sure, I, bet I want to make sure that you people do understand that what this entry is going to be. So you see, you have an interest expense of 0.5, you would say, finance cost debit by 0.5. There's a service cost. So let's say I'm recording the service cost as an admin expense of 20. Then there are contributions paid, which is the cash credited by 17. Then what actually happens is the defined benefit liability. The opening liability was 10 and the closing liability is 15. So there's an increase of five in the liability. The liability would increase by five. The other comprehensive income would have a loss of 1.5. So if you try to calculate, you would see that it balances out. You see, it's balances out. Okay, when do we consider 19? We consider that 19 when, when we are calculating the pension plan assets and plan obligations separately. If you are not doing separately, you don't have to consider. So you got to say the expense of the expense of 20 shall be recognized under admin expense. An expense of 0.5 shall be recognized under the interest expense a remeasurement loss amounting to 1.5 to be recognized as a comprehensive income. A defined benefit liability of 15 is to be recognized under the non-current liability. So do you people get it? You got to show the workings, you got to show the calculations, and this is how you're gonna answer it. Okay, um, the point is uh, the working doesn't get difficult, but uh, the point is there are other areas that you need to consider. So just try to go through it and see in case if there is any question that you will have. Yeah, if there are any questions that you will have. Any questions that you people have? Yeah, Murtza Zaid, you would like to ask any question? No, sir, I just want to ask, how are you? Hope you are doing good. I think you have just joined in now because uh, I've been teaching for last one and a half hour almost. And Alhamdulillah, I'm good. So that's why I've been able to teach well. How is your preparation going along? Sir, it's going wonderful. And actually I passed this paper earlier, but I just wanted uh, to be. Okay, good luck. Enjoy yourself. Now, so guys, we have done this specific part now. Okay, now, uh, Anishta, you're asking, the, do we need to write same wording for all question of this type? Um, well, sort of, yes. It's just that it's no, I mean, like I have not done anything extra. It says that I've, I've, I've actually explained to you a simple working, a simple working, that's it. 
I've done nothing extra. I've just done a simple working and I've just explained that what is the amount to be recognized in balance sheet uh -huh. under which, 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 which head and what amount is to be recognized in the panel uh -huh. under which, which head. Note care. Right, is it okay? Is it okay? Lovely. So let's move on to the next question and let's try to log on to the next question now. So when you would actually Uh, yes, Saidu, it's going to be shared with you after the class. Uh, just wait for the class to end, I'll inshallah share it. Now, is it okay to you people? Okay, there is another part of the question, uh, which is actually uh, not about IS 19, but it is actually about IS 37. But I personally think that you all have already studied IS 37 uh, in the uh, you've already studied IS 37. So I just thought that maybe uh, we could have a discussion on IS 37 here also. You could just try to attempt this question. So giving you five minutes time, you people may try to do this part B, William. Giving you five minutes time, you people may try to do the question, William. Yeah, this is actually about the relocation cost. So giving you five minutes time. Uh, my Kakoto, it's perfectly depending upon what do you find comfortable. I actually would do working first because, but in this scenario, I just did not do the working because I was writing down the answers. So I just uh, continued with the flow. So you take two, three minutes, uh, try to do this part right.
Okay, so now what happens is in this case, it says William operates at, I mean, like again, I uh, just, uh, I'm just actually doing uh, out of, um, uh, I just thought that maybe you people have an idea about what IS 37 is all about. So that's why I'm just doing it. It says William operates a defined benefit pension plan for its employees. Um, for its employees, shortly before the year end of 31st May 3, William decided to relocate a division from one country. So there is a one country to another where labor and raw material costs are cheaper. So they're relocating. The relocation is due to take place in December 3. On 13 May 2003, a detailed formal plan was approved by the board of directors. Half of the affected division's employee will be made redundant in first in July 13 and will accrue no further benefits under the pension scheme. The affected employees were informed of the decision on 14 May 3. The resulting reduction in net pension liability due to rural location is estimated to have a present value of 15 million. The total relocation costs, excluding the impact on the pension plan, are estimated at 50 million. So the resulting reduction in the net liability due to relocation is estimated to have so and so. The total relocation costs, excluding the impact of the pension plan, are estimated to be 50 million. Now let's just try to understand. There are basically two aspects to it. How many of you remember the restructuring? How many of you remember restructuring? Yeah, how many of you remember restructuring? Okay, now let me just give you a bit of a guidance so that uh, we could just go on doing it. Basically, if I talk about the concept of restructuring, it's covered up under IS 37. Restructuring provision. Now, if I talk about the concept of restructuring, so the concept of restructuring is that basically a closure of a location, business, disposal of a segment, etc etc or basically changes in a way business is conducted so that is all going to be considered as a restructuring that is taking place so ias 37 what does it say it says an entity shall recognize provision for restructuring when there is a constructive obligation to restructure. So you have to recognize the provision for restructuring when there is a constructive obligation to restructure. And you would say that the constructive obligation to restructure exists when both the following conditions are met. Number one, there's a detailed formal plan identifying at least Detailed formal plan identifying at least the number of employees covered by the plan, the locations 
to be affected? The cost to be incurred? Date when the plan will be implemented? And a valid expectation is created amongst those affected by the plan either by announcing its main features to them or by starting to implement the plan. So basically, whenever an entity undertakes restructuring, so in order to undertake the restructuring, you have to recognize the restructuring provision. And for you to be able to recognize the restructuring provision, the restructuring provision is recognized when uh, there is a constructive obligation to restructure that exists. And constructive obligation exists when both the following, both the following conditions are met. Now, the next important thing that you need to understand is that while recognizing the restructuring provision, while recognizing the provision, the provisions shall not be made for the future expenses, but rather should only be made for the past cost, but rather should be made for the past cost. Right? Do we will understand this now? So how exactly are we gonna write down the answer with respect to this William? For this case, William, so for the William, what would happen is that you would say, the decision to relocate the factory is a restructuring and the entity and William should recognize, recognize a provision for the restructuring if it is able to demonstrate that a formal, that a detailed formal plan to restructure exists and that the detailed formal plan to restructure exists and that the and that the entity has created expectation amongst the affected employees slash personnels about the plan. So what would happen is that From the scenario, it can be seen that a detailed formal plan exists which identifies the number of, which identifies the number of
employees to be made redundant and also provides for the cost to be incurred furthermore before the year end on 14th of may the details of the plan have already been announced based on above a constructive obligation to restructure exist and hence a provision for the dollar 50 million provision for the dollar 50 million shall be recognized furthermore the closure of the defined benefit scheme would result in reduction in the liability by dollar 15 million and hence again on the curtailment slice settlement of dollar 15 million shall be recognized and the related liability be recognized for the post employment benefit do people get it now do people get it yeah there is obviously a reason that uh, yeah you will get the recordings everyone is going to get the recording i know i myself uh, uh, actually being able to conduct the class with a lot of difficulties but yes now see what happens is that um basically the entity if it does not recognize the provision that means it does not recognize the expense because the double entry is expense debit provision credit so when you recognize the provision it has to be expense debit provision credit so entities would want to avoid the recognition of expense i paid the entities would want to rec the defer the recognition of expense that's what the entities would try to do i will give it i'll give it do people get it now so we are done with this specific question which was about joint and company ethics question is around 10 marks 8 marks something like that okay so i will i'll continue i mean like it's day after tomorrow that i will have another class 
but I'll continue doing some more questions. And I'm sure that as soon as we do more questions, you people will get more confidence. So um, that's it for today. I shall actually uh, continue day after tomorrow. The PDF would be made available immediately, inshallah. Recordings would be made available by tomorrow. In the meantime, um, I can